everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to our presentation tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we have a great presentation this evening from Juanita Brown, author of the book Gardening for Biodiversity. Juanita is going to be giving us her top tips um, on how to make your garden an oasis for wildlife this spring and summer. The book, as you may know, was written for us last year by Juanita and beautifully illustrated by Barry Reynolds. And it's been reprinted this year as part of the Keep Well Initiative, a Government of Ireland campaign supported by Pubble and Salon Care. And we're very grateful for their support. It's allowed us to make copies of the book available for free for anyone who wants them. And feel free to email us um, or comment below uh, the post this evening if you'd like us to send you out one. Hopefully when we get back to a level that allows libraries to open, there'll be copies in all the libraries as well. So on to our presentation tonight. Uh, Juanita Brown is a zoologist, a writer and a broadcaster with a string of great publications under her belt, including the great big book of Irish wildlife and a firm favourite in our house, uh, my first book of Irish animals, which is a great favourite among my kids uh, for many years. They're all available in the libraries and I think still available to purchase as well. Uh, many of you will also know Juanita from her wonderful work with the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan, aiming to change the fortune of Ireland's bees. So we're delighted that Juanita has taken time out of her extremely busy schedule to join us this evening. We'd love to hear your questions or your comments. Just type them into the comments box here and we'll have time for a quick uh, chat Q&A afterwards. Um, so I'll hand you over to Juanita and you might have to bear with us while we mess around with the screen settings. That's great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so hopefully this will all work. Um, yeah, so I suppose uh, myself and Catherine came up with this idea of um, doing a booklet called Gardening for Biodiversity. And um, so I'm just going to introduce all the different things you can do in your garden uh, to help biodiversity. But before I, I do that, I'd like to just kind of take a minute to think about why, why should we bother to think about biodiversity in our own gardens? Um, there's two main reasons. One is that it's good for us. It's, it's really good for our health. So it's been proven that exposure to uh, nature helps lower blood pressure, lowers inflammatory compounds, um, it promotes cancer fighting cells, reduces stress, anxiety, depression. And in the last year, I think all of us have become more aware of how good it is for us to spend time outdoors and in nature. And it's actually been proven that the more biodiverse an area is, the better it is for us. So all of those benefits go up if you're in an area with a lot of nature. So compared, comparing say a walk in a park that is really tightly mown grass and just a few trees, isn't as good for you as a walk in a grassland or a, a forest where there's an awful lot of biodiversity and birds and, and insects and so on. So I suppose that's one reason, you know, uh, to, to think what, if it is so good for us, why would we not bring it right to our doorstep? Why would we keep very manicured lawns and very sterile gardens when we could actually have native Irish uh, wildlife coming right to our door? And the other reason, I suppose, is because gardening is good. Uh, gardening for biodiversity is good for the planet. You know, this can also be, as well as uh, COVID-19, we have an awful lot of um, anxiety over climate change and extinctions, and we're getting an awful lot of bad news all of the time. The pressure is on the planet. Um, the Living Planet Index you know, showed 68% decline in mammals, birds, fish, and amphibians since 1970. So we are seeing uh, you know, the sixth mass extinction. And you know, sometimes it can be very abstract. You think of polar bears or rhinoceros, um, but it's actually happening across the board in, in very common insects and, and other species as well. So in Ireland, you know, we do have some wonderful wildlife um, and it's easy to kind of think everything's okay because you tend to think of extinction or not extinct. Um, but actually we're seeing massive declines. So one in five species in Ireland um, of all types of, you know, insects, uh, mammals, birds, are actually threatened with extinction. So we've lost an awful lot of yellowhammer, corn craig, curlew. And it's important to realize that even though we have still, you know, an array of species on the planet or in Ireland, um, it's about abundance as well. So there's a, a phenomenon called, um, an ecologist coined in 95 called shifting baseline syndrome and it basically uh, explains how you know one generation gets used to what is around for them and what what they're used to so uh, people my age will 
you know, look back and kind of remember slightly different environments, you know, that they would have seen a lot of caterpillars, uh, hairy mollies, or they would have seen a lot of white um, moths coming into the house at night time, or just more, more wildflowers, more insects, more bees buzzing in the garden. But if you don't remember that, my kids aren't going to think there's anything wrong. They're going to think, well, this is normal. The amount of insects they see is normal. So with the you know, the seas, it's very clear, fish stocks have declined, you're getting more jellyfish, more plastic, all of that. Um, and they also, you know, call it generational amnesia. So things might seem okay to us, but they're not actually how they would have appeared to previous generations. And in Ireland, that might be hay meadows, for instance. So we've lost a lot of our, our um, traditional hay meadows that would have been, you know, created an awful lot of niches and opportunities for biodiversity. And we've become really, really good at tidying up the countryside, tidying up our gardens, our parks, our cities, and um, using sprays. You know, we're really good at growing grass for livestock, but it means that we're squeezing nature out the more we do that. I like this uh, graphic from the Peak District in the UK, because again, it shows, you know, you're looking on the left and you're, you're thinking that looks fine like we have lots of different variety of birds but they have realized that the, the ratios are all wrong and that the abundance of some of their species is not healthy and another uh, phenomenon that we talk about or hear about a lot is um, the windscreen uh, phenomenon that is used to show people the changes in insect abundance. So if you look back at the 80s or 90s, driving across the countryside in Ireland, you would have to stop and clean your windscreen. You know, you're hitting an awful lot of insects. That doesn't really happen anymore. And you might think, so what, that's brilliant. I don't have to do that. But it's really shocking to go to parts of Donegal or the West where you do start to see it again. So you say, well, what's happening in, in the East or more urban areas? Why, why do we not have that many insects? And it is, it's staggering actually, the, the loss in insect life around the world. So a study came out uh, in 2017 um, from Germany of 62 nature reserves spread across the country. And the fact that it was in nature reserves was even more revealing. Um, where scientists and entomologists and citizen scientists went out and trapped flying insects um, every year for 27 years. And they showed this massive decrease of three quarters, basically a quarter of the abundance of insects uh, were there after 27 years. And so the fact that it was in nature reserves is very revealing because, you know, we tend to think of nature reserves as a, a safe refuge for our wildlife. And no matter what else is happening outside of reserves, we have it there. That's where our nature is safe. But this actually showed that that isn't the case, that we're seeing absolute collapse of insect populations. Um, E.O. Wilson, Edward Wilson is a famous ecologist. And, you know, he said, if mankind was to disappear, the world would be fine. It would actually do really well. Nature would, um, you know, recover and it would reach a, a, a healthier state than it's in now. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And that's very, very true for lots of reasons. Some, you know, insects are actually the base of most food chains for other biodiversity. They're pollinators, they're pest control species. So they give us an awful lot of wealth that we don't realize actually. And um, this is a, just a graphic from the book to show that, you know, as we lose habitats, as we lose that patchwork of habitats in the countryside um, through, you know, drainage, land drainage or intensive farming, we lose niches for biodiversity. So I suppose the gardening side of it is that it gives, it's a feel good thing, not just because it's nice to, to feed birds and it's nice to see them coming into your garden or it's nice to hear bumblebees buzzing in the summer, but it actually gives you something uh, tangible that you can actually control. So you can realize that, you know, even if you have a very small garden, this is your, you're very lucky to have this plot of land and what can you do to actually make it valuable for other species? So it kind of gives you a little bit of control back in, a, in what can be a really overwhelming, um, you know, uh, environment to be working in. Um, and there's over two, two million gardens in Ireland and that's a huge, you know, area of land. So if, all of those were to do one thing for biodiversity. You're talking about a network, you're creating a network of these sites across the, the landscape that could really have an impact 
on, especially on common species, the, you know, the, the common garden species that actually are declining as well. So when we say biodiversity, we, you know, we basically mean wildlife, but it's a better way of explaining that it's, you know, you think about soil biodiversity, the worms, the insects, the ants, you know, ladybirds, beetles, all these things are integral to ecosystems. So from the dung beetle breaking down, um, you know, livestock waste, really, really important, ladybird larvae and ladybirds eating aphids in your garden, you know, everything uh, has evolved in, in our native countryside to work together. And um, the more we lose any of these species, the more effects it has on, on our ecosystem services. So the first one, I suppose I wanted to look at providing food, shelter and safety for um, all types of biodiversity. And for birds, it's very easy to have birds in your garden. So you can decide to go to a garden centre and buy, you know, seeds and sunflower seeds. Um, there's lots of mixes available, peanuts. You're going to get a beautiful range of birds visiting your garden. But a lovely thing to do that's even more sustainable than that is to actually grow natural bird food. So as simply as, you know, planting native trees, you're going to actually encourage native insects because um, they've evolved to be used to living in native trees and shrubs and they feed our birds um, and likewise berry producing birds. So things like blackthorn, ivy, um, you know, bird cherry, there's lots and lots of varieties to choose from that will actually provide that food in your garden without you having to go and buy um, commercial seed. Uh, these are two birds on my office window here. So if I, I'm not, you know, out early enough to feed the, the birds, they kind of come looking. This is a collar dove looking through the window. And um, because a lot of blue tits and robins will come into this uh, perspex bird feeder, it, they attracted a sparrow hawk um, a few weeks ago, uh, checking it out, wanting to know why, you know, why the small birds are up there all the time. Um, another nice thing to do is to create a bird bath. You know, we've lost a lot of our ponds in the countryside, so providing water is really important for both drinking and bathing. And it's a really nice activity. Great if you have kids, you know, to make a simple bird bath. And then you can, if you have it in view of a window, you can watch them uh, bathing and the antics of those. Just to say, you know, we tend to look out and think you have two blue tits coming to your bird feeder every day. And they, you know, they're your garden bird blue tits. But Brian Burke in Birdwatch Ireland was ringing blue tits in his garden and um, in 12 months caught 119 different blue tits using his garden. I think that's amazing that, you know, you think it's the same bird all the time, but you could actually be having a huge impact on lots of different birds that will visit lots of gardens. And um, you can also think about providing shelter. So there's different types of bird houses for different species. So robins like open fronted and wagtails open fronted um, uh, nest boxes and blue tits like these traditional ones that you see most often with the, the small hole. A uh, grey tit likes uh, a similar one with, with a bigger hole. And then there's different nest boxes for things like house martins. A lot of people give out about house martins, you know, they they do leave their droppings out, uh, under your gable or under your roof, but it's really important to remember that they've, you know, they've flown 10,000 kilometers from South Africa to get to Ireland and they return to the same nests every year. So we have them on our house and when you get used to it or you, you know, just decide to accept it, um, it's actually amazing to see them swooping around in the evening in the summer, catching insects. Um, and I'm really lovely to, you know, to see them coming and going. Swifts are also um, an amazing bird that you can help if, you know, if swifts have traditionally nested on your house, you can put up swift boxes or you can uh, download an amazing publication called Saving Swifts from Leash County Council and Birdwatch Ireland that explains how to encourage swifts to a new area. Um, it's a bit more complicated than some of the other nest boxes. Um, then to talk about insects, I work on the All Ireland pollinator plant, so I can't not talk about uh, bees and other insects. Um, the simplest way to help is actually to change your mowing. So if you have, uh, you know, a large lawn area, maybe some of it can 
be allowed to flower. So some of it could even grow a little bit longer and let clover and dandelion flower. Really, really important food source for him, a whole range of, of bees. Um, just to kind of uh, explain why bees are so important, um, you know, this is an apple tree in my garden and my 11 year old said last summer, why, you know, why does it have flowers? I thought this was an apple tree, you know, that they, they've lost that knowledge of um, that, you know, in order to produce fruit, these blossoms have to be pollinated and that's what becomes your apple. Likewise, strawberries, cucumber, tomatoes, you know, really a lot of the really delicious fruits and veg that we enjoy and that help us to have a nutritious diet do come from animal pollinated plants, usually bees. And bees are the, the most important pollinators because they're focused wholly on collecting pollen. So they bring pollen back to the nest to feed to their larvae and they also drink nectar themselves. So there's a, you know, a bumblebee collecting uh, pollen in specialized hairs on his back legs for, or her back legs for, um, to bring back to the nest from dandelion. So dandelion is really, really a superfood for bees. Pollinators are important for the economy. So they pollinate a lot of uh, crops up to 59 million annually in Ireland, um, just on crops alone. Important for our health and well-being in terms of diet. You know, a lot of our foods, like even chocolate, <laughs> rely on insect pollinators. Um, and while we wouldn't starve, you'd still have wind-pollinated crops. You know, it would be much more difficult to have a balanced diet. So it is actually true to say, in terms of you know food production, they're really, really vital. They're also important in terms of wildlife and our landscape because a lot of the plants, seventy-eight percent of our wild flowering species are pollinated by insects. And without them, Ireland would look like a very different place. And it'd be much more difficult to sell our products abroad than ones that are based on Ireland having this green image and you know a flower uh, rich, beautiful countryside. And we wouldn't be producing the same amount of seeds and berries and so on. Those plants wouldn't be able to for birds and mammals. These are photographs from China, you know, in parts of China, they have lost, they've wiped out a lot of their pollinators. So this is how they have to now hand pollinate um, their fruit trees. You know, it, it seems crazy that, you know, that might be ahead of us. Um, and, and you can imagine the impact on the cost of fruit and food production if you had to hand pollinate crops. Uh, these are, <laughs> there's three or four labs around the world working on robot pollinators to replace our pollinators. So again, you know, I, I suppose I think it's interesting that we tend to think technology can solve everything. But if you think of the trillions of insects on the planet um, doing this job for us, it seems absolutely crazy to risk losing them whether we have technology or not, you're never going to, I can imagine these getting caught in bushes and spiders webs and, you know, sending them out to pollinate a crop seems a hugely, uh, a huge task that they just wouldn't be up to. And um, who are our pollinators in Ireland? We have um, mainly our bees, as I said, but also flies are really important, hoverflies, wasps, moths, butterflies, um, beetles and ants all do a certain amount of pollination. And our bees are made up of one honeybee. So a lot of the credit always goes to the honeybee. And they are, of course, important and they produce amazing honey for us. Um, but the most pollination is actually done by these wild species. So in Ireland, we have 21 different types of bumblebee and 77 solitary bees. There are wild pollinators. The 21 bumblebees, you know, have a range of colours. They're furry, beautiful insects, really interesting uh, lifestyles. Um, and up close, you know, they really are amazing to look at. Um, it's important to remember, you know, we tend to think of them in spring and summer. So that's when we might go to a garden centre and, you know, ask for a, a pollen rich plants or bee friendly plants. But it's actually in early spring and in late autumn that they're actually most at risk of starvation. So they don't, bumblebees don't store food like honeybees do and um, they don't make honey. So this is a queen bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, and when she leaves, um, her hibernation, she has to visit 6,000 flowers a day just to get enough energy to brood her first batch of eggs. So the colony won't survive if she starves. And because they can't store food, you know, it's always true to say that they're only a couple of days away from starvation all the time. 
Um, so things like dandelion and willow are really, really important in early spring. And then in autumn for her to build up, for the next queens to build up um, fat reserves to see them through winter, it's things like bramble at the end of summer and ivy. Ivy is a really important food source um, because it flowers late. And ivy is, of course, also really important for birds because it'll provide food for birds through the winter. These are solitary bees. People don't know them as much, but really, really important pollinators. Um, I'm sorry, we have 77 species of, of these guys. We'll be talking about them later. Um, so yeah, it's important to say bees are important because the more bees you have, the more wild plants you have, and the more wild plants you have, you have more insects and vertebrates and fruits and seeds to feed to our birds and mammals. So it has a knock-on effect, just like it does in terms of ecosystem services for humans, for pest control and providing uh, pollination services and all these other benefits. Insects actually are really, really important to us. Um, the pollinator plan is all about reaching out to different sectors, be it for gardens or farmers or councils, local communities, and providing evidence-based actions for people to help. Um, they're all freely available to download from pollinators.ie, the website. And I urge you to go on there and have a look. There's videos and animations and lots of different resources to help you understand how you can uh, make changes, whether you have a business or a garden, um, or if you're in a tidy towns group, there's lots of accessible actions there. And it's all about people coming together. That's the great thing about it is that if you're doing something in your garden, you can go onto our mapping system and put in your actions and you'll see how they link up with all the other groups taking actions for pollinators. Um, just to yeah, to explain some of the actions, one of the most important is to protect areas that you already have that are really good for biodiversity. So sometimes people would ring up and say that they want to, they're taking out a terrible area of bramble and they're going to put down wildflower seed. And we would say that's not a good thing for biodiversity, actually, that the ivy is really important or the bramble is really important. So it's about recognizing, learning what is good for biodiversity and what isn't and uh, learning to protect what is. Um, and also, as I said earlier, altering the frequency of mowing your grass is a great action. You know, letting dandelions bloom, they're going to start blooming soon. And if you can avoid cutting the grass till the end of, or mid-April, and then if you can even cut at the end of each month through May, June, July, you know, there's been calls for no mow May. Um, that pollen in clover and dandelions is really, really vital at this time of year. Um, you might also want to create a strip in your garden uh, for pollinators. So, you know, you're not giving up the, your whole garden. You're just making this strip for biodiversity. And it's important, to, you know, we tend to, I heard a great thing um, uh, Dave Goulson said about weeds, you know, and he said that he has this amazing uh, way of getting rid of all the weeds in your garden at once. And it's to start calling them wildflowers. I thought that's very good. You don't have weeds, you just have wildflowers. Um, and yeah, the, you can see, this is how a bee would see a dandelion, absolutely like a target. You know, they're really attractive to them. They know that they're, they're full of really important food. Um, one of the obstacles to that uh, production of food for pollinators is this guy. So um, uh, these ride on moors have become very popular. It's something to do at the weekend. You go out and you have, you're able to create like a golf course um, look, but this is what you're getting rid of. So, you know, we would say, do we have to have these massive lawns? Um, instead, could you let some of it grow as a wildflower lawn um, and cut paths through it? So it's amazing what will come up. And it is those simple wildflowers, but birds for trefoil, clovers that are really, really important. Um, this is a nice story from Leash, actually from Port Leash Housing Estate last year. Because of the lockdown, um, the people didn't get out to cut the, this lawn in the council estate or in the housing estate. So Greenwind Orchid uh, showed up for the first time in 120 years. Um, so that's amazing. You know, it really shows that if we stop cutting, it's not about going out and planting a load of wildflower seeds. If we stop cutting grass, these amazing flowers will come up. They are there, they're in the seed bank, bank. They can last for you know hundreds of years. So it's just a matter of giving them the opportunity to grow up. And we've also produced some videos. So, because we do get an awful lot of queries from people about wildflower meadows and these new videos on our website should help explain how you develop that, how you, you go in and you, 
let a, a area grow and you remove the clippings to reduce the soil fertility that will help wildflowers to compete with the grasses. So these videos really give a step by step approach to developing a wildflower meadow. It's really important to say as well that we've we've sort of bred the goodness out of a lot of our flowers. So these bedding plants that you traditionally get, you know, a lot of groups would be buying these two or three times a year or councils. And they're like disposable plants. They're like put, putting out plastic plants, really, because they don't have pollen and nectar. You know, um, they don't produce food for pollinators. They just look good. We've bred them to look really good. Um, and, you know, again, you have to wonder, is that sustainable? Is it not better to plant perennials that will, you know, you'd have for 10 to 12 years um, to provide lots of food for pollinators? So while you can still keep these, maybe you can mix in some other pollinator friendly varieties. There's also lots to choose from. It's not that you're going to have a really dull garden if you go for, you know, pollinator friendly plants. Lots of different colours and um, they can flower right through the year. And that's a great thing to do is to have things that are flowering in spring, summer, autumn, winter, so that early uh, bumblebees and late bumblebees um, will be able to benefit from those. Uh, likewise, you're going to get a lot of butterflies to your garden. You know, they're visiting flowers to drink nectar. Um, we have some beautiful butterflies in Ireland. Um, you can also grow fruit and veg or a herb bed or a herb pot. We're doing new um, little guides on planting a pot for pollinators and uh, even a window box. You know, you don't have to have a massive garden. You could have one pot uh, on a patio or on a windowsill that is pollinator friendly and they will find it. Um, you can also create nesting sites. So in terms of shelter for our bees, we have 62 species of mining bees who just need bare soil on a south or east facing bank. So if you have a larger garden, you might want to expose the, the soil there. And again, on the website, pollinators.ie, there's um, guidelines explaining exactly how to do that. Likewise, the cavity nesting solitary bees, so these get a lot of attention. You do hear a lot about people building bug hotels and they build massive structures that can look very cool, but we don't actually recommend those because they're more likely to, you know, uh, suffer from par parasites or disease um, or predators. You know, they, you're putting an awful lot of organisms into one space. Much better to put up a few small um, nest boxes, uh, bee nest boxes around your garden than to do that. Another thing you can do is have an untidy area of your garden. So an area maybe where you will let brambles grow or ivy or nettles. So nettles are a really important food plant for some of our butterflies. So the small tortoise shell and um, red admiral, peacock, beautiful butterflies, and they need to lay their eggs on the underside of nettle leaves. That's where that's what caterpillars want to eat. And um, so you're, they're basically bringing their eggs right to the plant. Um, so, yeah, while we think, oh, they're, you know, uh, what's good about nettles, they are actually part of our uh, biodiversity. Um, we also have a, the mapping system, like I mentioned, so you can go in and log your garden on actions for pollinators. Um, another nice thing you can do is to make a log pile for mini beasts. So, again, if you, you might think, well, you know, I don't, I don't like insects, why would I do this? You're going to be helping a lot of birds, you're going to be helping amphibians in your lawn. And um, if the more insects you have, the more you know larger um, animals that will be able to live in your garden. You'll also get a lot of different types of fungi, and it's really interesting, you know, to watch that. It, you're basically mimicking the forest floor by letting you know, getting these logs and creating a, an area for them to decompose. Another great thing to do is to plant native trees. And um, there's, you know, a whole range to choose from. There's small trees for small gardens um, or you might want to plant uh, fruit trees that are good for, um, you know, uh, biodiversity. So even if they're not native, if you want to put in some apple trees, uh, that's going to help all our insects. These you can see here, these are native trees, crab, apple, willow. Willow supports 266 insect species, like massive, massively important to insects. Uh, obviously, if you have a massive garden, you, you might go for an oak tree, um, but you've also whitethorn and, and smaller trees that can be coppiced and kept small. Another great thing to do is to plant a native hedgerow. Uh, willow can be grown from cuttings through winter, so that's a nice activity to do that you'll find in the booklet as well. 
um, just to say about hedgerows, like hedgerows and, and grasslands, like if we could get our, our hedgerows, if we could manage them in the right way, that would go so far in helping our native biodiversity. You know, you see an awful lot of hedgerows that are kept uh, trimmed like this. And again, a bit like the ride on moor, we have these hedge cutting machines now with flails and they're able to cut back hedgerows into this shape. But this isn't actually a traditional hedgerow in Ireland. This isn't how they would have been managed up till about 50 years ago, you know, we would let them flower, they would be larger, they would be protecting livestock and giving shelter to livestock. And um, so really, you know, we try to encourage where possible, especially on off road hedgerows, to let them flower, to let them grow larger. Um, and it's amazing what that'll do for all types of biodiversity, insects, birds, bats, and so on. Um, these are lovely graphics from Farming for Nature's website. And you can see the different types of hedgerow and how much biodiversity you're helping by having different types of hedgerows. So, for instance, this one that's cut very tightly and, and it's broken, it's not actually providing shelter for the livestock and it's not good for biodiversity. And then you can see a really good hedgerow with mixed levels of um, hedgerow allowed to flower and some trees are allowed to grow up tall. Um, another thing that we're seeing a lot is roadside verges being cut, a bit like the lawn is now extended out onto the roadside. It's great if you can consider not doing that. You know, it's another niche. It was a refuge for a lot of our wild plants and insects. So roadside verges are a way to actually maybe step back and say, OK, well, I'll keep my, my tight lawn, but I'll let the roadside uh, grow naturally. And the, things like these dandelions, you know, this is the same spot near me. Um, and, you know, it's actually dangerous to get up onto that bank with a strimmer, but, you know, people really have a thing about dandelions. So if we could start to see them differently, I think um, we'd be doing an awful lot of good for pollinators. If you're helping insects in your garden, you're also helping bats. And, and likewise, bats help us. So a small pipistrelle bat will eat about 3,000 midges a night. So, you know, if you're having barbecues over the summer, it's quite nice to have bats in your in your garage or in your attic and uh, that will come out and take care of some of those. Um, you also get a, a huge range of, of um, moths. We have uh, nearly 1400 species in Ireland, all different types, absolutely beautiful, some of them. Another thing you can do is a wetland area. So this is obviously a step up from maybe a, a pollinator pot. Um, but if you have a garden that will take even a small pond, it doesn't have to be huge. I've, I've seen now projects where they use barrels um, as little mini ponds, sunken barrels or sinks. Um, all these wetland areas actually do help and they will attract species. So, you know, we've lost over 50% of our ponds in the country. And that has an effect on uh, dragonflies and frogs and uh, newts and all these lovely creatures that we associate with wetlands. And they also have knock-on effects for things like otters as well that actually feed on frogs, frogs like 19% of the diet of um, the otter is, is uh, frogs, which is amazing, I think. So making a pond is fairly straightforward, actually. And if you put in the right plants, if you put in ox oxygenating plants or, you know, get native plants from local uh, water sources, it's not going to take an awful lot of maintenance. And if you don't put fish in, it's best not to put fish in a wildlife pond because they'll eat all these lovely insects that want to occupy it. But you will get frogs coming to breed there and laying frog spawn. You might get newts that uh, underwater, they lay one egg um, inside a leaf and curl up the leaf, amazing creatures. And they have X instead of um, tadpoles. Uh, lots of different water insects, diving beetles, damselflies, dragonflies. Um, really amazing thing to do is to to have a pond that develops year on year um, and you can have you know beautiful uh, plants around it like yellow flag. An alternative to that is if you don't want open water in your garden if you're small children for instance you might want to create a wet area or if you have a wet area to put in the right um, you know you can get native wetland plants or um, from a garden centre either so you're creating that wet area, which again is another different habitat. It's like a marsh boggy habitat in your garden for amphibians and for different types of insects. Uh, like some hoverflies will uh, breed in these sort of wet conditions. And hoverflies, they're amazing pollinators, but they're also great for pest control. So the larvae actually feed on aphids. So again, great thing to have in your garden. 
Um, of course, I work for the National Biodiversity Data Centre and another lovely thing you can do in your garden is to actually record biodiversity, to record what you see. So the, while Birdwatch Ireland run the Garden Bird Survey every uh, winter, um, the data centre also runs the butterfly monitoring scheme or we have a flower insect time count where you just look at a patch of flowers for 10 minutes and record the number of insects that visit. There is obviously bigger schemes, the bumblebee monitoring scheme and the butterfly monitoring scheme which will take you out of your garden, but really nice schemes to get involved in. And you can also just go in to uh, our biodiversity data capture app and on our website and actually record um, any garden visitors, anything you see in your garden. Um, just to mention again, <laughs> the always the bearer of bad news, um, another great thing you can do to help biodiversity is to reduce the use of pesticides. So it's to get away from thinking that you can use chemicals to clean up or tidy up your garden. You know, this sort of management isn't necessary. Um, it's unsustainable. And it's important to remember, like this, this is along a, a stream that I took myself. I, I couldn't believe that they'd actually sprayed along a water course and there was kids swimming downstream. And, you know, one drop of pesticide will pollute drinking water for 30 kilometers. So, it will, you know, it has effect, it has effects on humans, it has huge effects on insects. Um, so there's just sustainable things you can do. It's best to try and get peat-free compost. It's difficult to get, but it's good to ask in garden centers. They're only going to stock it if people start asking for it or make your own compost. So yeah, best to stay away from peat because obviously peat bogs are really, really important habitats in their own right. Um, again, spraying on the roadside like this, is it necessary? Does it look better than cow parsley flowering on the opposite side? Um, outside of, you know, along fences, around trees, is that really necessary? And is it what we should be putting into the environment? Uh, just to a reminder that these sort of plants, dandelion, willow, bramble, clover and ivy, I, I would call them our gold star plants. So if you can make room in your garden for these, it's really, really going to help biodiversity. And just to thank Catherine Casey and Leash County Council for coming behind this project. It wouldn't exist without Catherine, um, who really, uh, you know, was enthusiastic and got on board with this. And um, all these different NGOs around Ireland that need your help and provide amazing service, provide amazing information. So, you know, the Herpetological Society, Bat Conservation Ireland, Birdwatch Ireland, the Native Woodland Trust, the Irish Wildlife Trust, you know, do go on to their sites and um, sign up as members. You know, there's an awful lot of different, that's also something that will really help biodiversity and they produce beautiful publications and educational resources. And if you're bur buying bird seeds, you know, you can buy it from the Birdwatch Ireland shop. So there's lots of ways of helping these NGOs um, while you're also gardening. And just to leave you with this, I, I like this idea that, you know, we used to have wild countryside now and, you know, the garden was somewhere to keep very, very neat and different from that. You know, in the 18th century style yards, we all very neat uh, pruned uh, hedges and bushes and so on. But now it's almost the opposite, that our, as our countryside gets more and more um, manicured and neat, nice, maybe we have to rewild our gardens. And this garden festival poster from Glasgow I thought was really good because it kind of shows how biodiversity would see, how wildlife sees your environment. All the different gardens are actually what they're looking for instead of street names and buildings and so on. So that's it from me, Catherine. <laughs> No. William, Juanita, sorry, I was tapping away on the comments there. Um, <laughs> I, only have, I only have got to listen to, to your presentation. Um, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> no, I was listening, I promise. <laughs> we have a huge amount of comments, um, which is fantastic. Um, a lot of people are interested in getting a copy of the book. So just in case I missed anybody's comment, if you email heritage at leashcoco.ie, um, we'll get a copy posted out to you. Um, and also to say, um, Deirdre O'Brien McGivney just reminded me to remind people that it's also available to download for free as well. So if you don't want a hard copy, um, the book and the children's colouring book are on our website, leash.ie, and I've posted the full link in the comments there. Um, Juanita, I, I, you've had a good bit of talking there. Are you, are you good to go for a few questions? Yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> um, there are lots. One second now. Um, 
I've pasted them all in here and I'm going to try and go through them. Jackie wants to know what plants are good for butterflies and bats. I think you've covered that butterflies, but perhaps do you have yeah. anything to say about bats? I mean, bats I aren't really pollinators in Ireland, are they? Yeah, no, but what you can do is you can plant um, night scented plants, so honeysuckle and evening primrose. There's certain plants that release their scent at night, so they attract night flying insects. Um, okay, like, that's, sorry, that's what she means, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's absolutely a great thing to do. But, you know, you will, if you have a garden that is friendly to insects, if you're not using chemicals, if you're not spraying pesticides, um, you know, a lot of the time we're doing stuff, say we're trying to control caterpillars. We don't like caterpillars eating your vegetables, but we don't have any birds in the garden that would take care of that. Blue tits would eat, you know, huge amounts of caterpillars. Sometimes we're not, you know, we, by maybe spraying, getting rid of insects, you know, we think we're doing the right thing, but we end up with more problems. So yeah, I would actually plant things that attract insects and then you will get your bats and your, you know, uh, house martens and so on feeding on them. Um, Caroline is asking, what three things can we all do this spring to help? Simple and easy message we can share, please. I guess she wants to talk to her neighbours. <laughs> I think, yeah, brilliant. Um, well, this spring, like I think hedgerows and dandelions are amazing things to do, you know, to actually, if possible, let your hedgerows flower. I know it's probably too late now. A lot of them have already been cut, but even plan it for next year. Um, and dandelions, yeah. So let dandelions flower onto mid, until mid-April. That would have a huge effect. And like it sounds ridiculous because you know people hate them and they can't bear them but if you can even just let them before they set seed so that you don't end up with you know a lawn full of them the following year but just to let them flower is an amazing thing to do and the third what's our third um yeah, I suppose to stop using pesticides. You know, a lot of it's really important to realize that in Paris and Toronto and Barcelona have become pesticide free. And I think if those major cities can, in France, I think it's been banned. You can't buy pesticides in garden centers anymore. So you have to actually be a farmer to be able to spray them. Um, so I think that's really interesting, you know. There's a couple of people commenting. Somebody says they haven't seen a hairy molly in years. Um, Car says she's got seen a decline in Merlin woods and butterflies and bees since they started counting. I think that's in response to when you're saying insect declines. A lot of people have noticed that. Yeah. Um, Valerie mentions she's got cats that will wait and pounce on the birds when they're at the bird feeders, so the birds don't always get away. Can she, can you recommend another way of feeding the birds that might be safer for the safer? For yeah, I, I should have said that. Like that's one of the things is to try and put your bird feeder somewhere where a cat can't get to it. So away from bushes and trees. So it's kind of counterintuitive. You think you're putting it somewhere good, but if you've cats, if you own cats or if you have cats visiting your garden, it's better to actually put them on one of those kind of dangly poles that you can buy in a garden center, actually away from shrubbery. Yeah. Um, yeah. Harder for the cats. Yeah. Bernie is asking about a car park area. She says they've got small green patches and what can you suggest that they do that won't look too messy? I guess they want it to look semi sort of semi uh, neat for a car park, yeah. but that it provide an attractive display and relatively easily maintained. That's like the, the golden bullet. Yeah, but th there's there's lots of. I'll just um, share a screen again, actually, if you don't mind, um, because it's probably rather than trying to take down things. If you go onto the pollinators.ie website and our uh, resources section, um, I'm just uh ad adjusting this at the moment but if you go down through the resources you'll see lists of plants and uh, how to guides and um, so and if you click on one of these you know you'll get a full list that you can go into a garden center and uh, check out so some of them are shrubs so around a car park i would say actually don't bother trying to plant flowers you might want to plant some heathers and um, you know there's lots of different varieties to choose from they're really pretty and the main thing is when you're in a garden center, actually, if, if it's got an outdoor area, go to the plants that have insects on them. You know, they will show you the ones that uh, are good for pollinators. And it's it's staying away from roses and things like that that have really closed up petals and they've been bred in that way. Tulips, daffodils, unfortunately, don't have uh, a very poor uh, pollen and nectar stores. So it's about open single flower varieties and the ones that are interacting insects in your, in the garden center. But there's, there's loads of, I think in a way we have too many resources and it's difficult sometimes to find what you're looking for, but it is all there. You know, there's lots of, um, you know, signs you can put up, 
posters, um, plant lists. There's a planting code that has trees and shrubs um, in it. You know, uh, broken down climbers, like everything is is here. So please do go in and have a look around there. They're all free. I, I'll, I'll post the link to that website later on, but all, all of those yeah. resources are free to download, aren't they? Which Absolutely. Is yeah. yeah, yeah. A couple of fairly specific questions as well. Now, I mean, you've referred people to the resources again, so maybe they can go and look, but some Jill has a, a north facing tall wall and she's planted perennials and shrubs that are doing well, but she's hoping for advice on a good plant, a good tree to plant um, to cover the space. They've got clematis and honeysuckle. Um, but, but a good tree for a north facing wall. I, I'm not sure it's in a village. I'm not sure if it's in a garden. I don't um, know. Yeah, and I suppose you and you don't want to shade out the honeysuckle and the yeah. Tree. So something like um, Rowan maybe or I, yeah, I'd look at those even in this uh, the planting code. There's street trees, so like that are suitable for towns. If you have a look at those, it might be good to actually pick something that won't get too big um, to shade out all those other plants. Um, and it depends on whether you want to go native or ornamental, you know. Yeah. And do you want to say something about that? The, 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 I mean, normally the advice would be to, to stay native, but there are yeah. plenty of ornamental shrubs and trees that are good for pollinators in particular. Exactly. I think you can you can get hung up. In, I think in a garden situation, like generally on farmland and so on, and in parks, we would always be encouraging native. Native is always the way to go. But in a garden setting, it is absolutely fine. You know, you're going to be buying ornamental plants anyway. So... Choose, just choosing ones that are good for insects um, you know and provide food or pollen rich is a great way to balance that like to plant an apple orchard is really really good for pollinating insects so if you wanted to plant an apple tree and you can get so many different dwarf sizes as well they're a great option or climbing uh, climbers you know fruit trees are an amazing way to go because you're helping people you know there's a lovely community or orchards popping up all over the country in towns and villages and I think that's such a nice project because you know you have free fruit in autumn to enjoy and you're also helping pollinators earlier in the year. Perfect. Um, a couple of specific questions again. Um, Laura has frogs in her pond and she's wondering about some nice good pond plants. I think you've, you've got you've got some recommendations in the section on on the um yeah absolutely and there are like there's really specialized there's um pondhobby.ie is a dublin business that specializes in pond plants and most garden centers will have a selection of pond plants but just be careful i suppose sometimes you can get oxygenating plants that are, are good for your pond but then can cause problems if for biodiversity if they're invasive so just you know do your research and kind of you know, make sure that it's not going to become an invasive problem. Um, but if you have tadpoles already there, if you have uh, frogs breeding there, that's a really good sign, you know, that it isn't, um, you know, too nutrient rich or anything like that, that there is oxygen there. We put you on the, on the spot enough tonight. Just one last one. Um, okay. Bernie is asking for uh, recommendations for slugs to get them away from her soft planting. Apart from getting yeah. ducks, have you, have you got, have you got <laughs> suggestions for her? I know. No, it is difficult. Um, we would say don't use slug pellets if you can at all. Um, Presuming she doesn't want to, that's why she's asking, yeah. I, I'm assuming, yeah. So I've heard about um, copper wire. I haven't tried it now, but that you can put copper wire, or not like a band of copper that you can buy in garden centres as well. Um, that they don't like co uh, crossing copper seemingly. So you can put that around your pots or around your raised bed uh, and they really don't like it. So that's something you could try. Our beer traps are also, you know, you can, I think B&Q have some sort of uh, water traps as well that will trap slugs. So it's just, it's better for birds and hedgehogs. Basically, you know, if you put out a lot of slug pellets, the birds end up suffering from, you know, consuming those and so do hedgehogs can die from them as well. So if you can find ways with the copper wire or um, these uh, beer traps, it might be worth looking into that. I th I've heard about eggshells as well and coffee grounds so that they don't like crossing those, but I don't know. Yeah. How some of the slugs can be very um, determined. I mean, some of the thing you have to do really is sometimes is just learn to live with it a little bit yeah or i do know people who go out at night with a torch and <laughs> try and reduce their numbers but yeah i encourage hedgehogs definitely somebody suggesting salt on slugs which is not very not very pleasant for the slugs i don't i don't think but i guess it depends yeah. on how annoyed you are with them yeah 
<laughs> eggshells somebody else suggested um I tried eggshells and maybe I didn't use enough and definitely the slugs were happily going through them so okay. I don't know but I guess it, it trial and error there's lots of different things you can you can try um, yeah so lots of people just uh, thanking you for your presentation and um they have all found found things very useful just to let people know as well the book is still available um, for now, it's not obviously in the libraries because the libraries aren't open, unfortunately, at the moment. So if you want to email us at heritage at leashcoco.ie, we'll um, get a copy posted out to you. I'd just like to thank uh, Juanita sincerely once again for a wonderful presentation and also for writing the book for us. Um, it's been a massive success and we're thrilled with how popular it has been. Our thanks to all of you for watching and for all the great comments and questions. To our funders, the original book I should have mentioned was funded by the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage under the National Biodiversity Action Plan. And this reprint um, has been funded by the Healthy Ireland Keep Well initiative. We're grateful for all of that support. Um, but uh, once again, Renita, I'd just like to thank you most sincerely again. And we've had great feedback and lots of people watching. Um, we'll leave the recording, will be up here for about a month um, and we'll take it down then in fairness to Renita, we're not gonna leave her sitting on our website for per in perpetuity. But if anybody thinks of any questions afterwards, by all means, email them in and we might do an, a post on Facebook in the next day or two to try and answer some of the questions we didn't get to tonight. So thanks very much, everybody and have a happy evening. Thanks, Catherine.